So today's message is con- conforming. Conforming. Uh, starting off with Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. We're reading from the HRV, the Hebraic Roots Bible. Therefore, brethren, I call on you through the compassion of Elohim to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to Elohim, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind in order to prove by you what is the good and pleasing and perfect will of Elohim. So our minds have to be renewed. It's a process, a process of renewing our minds because we've been brought up in the world and uh, we're not of this world. We're really basically from the heavenly world and we're not to be conformed to this age, which is basically the world. The devil's been in charge of the world for an awful long time. He doesn't know it, but he's just lost it when uh, Yeshua was uh, crucified. He paid the penalty and uh, basically he's not really in charge anymore, but uh, he thinks he is and he's still doing a bit of, a lot of, a lot of damage. But we are not to be conformed to this age or the world or how the world thinks or what the world does. And that's pretty hard because there's a lot of influence out there, especially TV, wireless, schools and everything else. Isaiah 31 from the Living Bible, just for a change. Woe to my rebellious children, says the Lord. You ask advice from everyone but me and decide to do what I don't want to do, you yoke yourselves with unbelievers, thus piling up your sins. So as if you've been in this world long enough, you realise how the world affects us, how we compromise. You know, we've actually been brought up with complete compromising The world compromised the Sabbath to the Sunday and most of us, all of us basically, except uh, Sophie there has not been brought up Sunday services and uh, it was very difficult to change because my mother obeyed the Sunday, my dad obeyed the Sunday, everybody else obeyed Sunday and all of a sudden we've realised we had to change. And we tend to, because the world, there's so many unbelievers out there, it's very easy to get tied up with them. What they do, what they believe in, how they lead their lives. And uh, it's very hard to change. But he says, Woe to my rebellious children, says the Lord. You ask advice from everyone but me. And when we think of it too, a lot of occasions we are. We're asking everybody else. What should we do? Where should we work? What would she, how do we earn our money? Uh, how do we love? How do we not love? And we watch television and we watch their advice on TV and everywhere else. And we forget to ask Yahweh, what do we do? How do we do it? You know, when you get sick, what are your first thoughts that comes to your mind? I'll go to the doctors, ask him advice, his advice. Go to the hospital, I'll ask them what their, what's their advice. And we forget to ask Yahweh, Yahweh, right, what should I do? Where should I go? Who should I ask? Who should I visit? Psalm 119.63 I am a companion of all who fear you, yea, of those who keep your precepts. So here's a good uh, thing what we should be looking at to do is... Who's our companions? Who's the first person we call? Should be a believer. Should be probably a pastor. Should be those who love Yahweh. They're that should be our companions. 1 Corinthians 15.33 Do not be led astray. Bad companionships ruin good habits. You know, we look around today at the youth. You know, If they mix with bad companionships, 
it's usually their room. That's how most of them get into drugs. They're mixing with others who are testing and playing around with drugs and then they finally think, well, oh, they're doing it so I better do it. Maybe there's something in it, they're doing it. They're having fun, they're enjoying life. Maybe I should do what they do. Whereas when you follow Yahweh, you can't do what the world does. You will be like the people who you associate with. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with the wise shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be broken. It was interesting in my life, and I think in a lot of people who love Yahweh, their lives were very, it's, it's really sometimes very lonely life. Because there's not many people out there who love Yahweh. And so it, it can become a very lonely life in some ways, is that you've only got Yahweh. And when I was growing up, I had uh, four sisters, and we basically uh, led a fairly restricted life around the family and with them, so I never really mixed with those in the world except when I was at school. And so my life was was reasonably sort of lonely. I didn't have many friends of the, in the world, and so I really believed I led a very protected life. I didn't get mixed up with drugs and robbery and you know things bad things and uh, it helped me probably later on in life when I was in the uh, Rover Scouts and the, these guys were all drinking and womenizing and all sorts of things but I never seemed to get involved because I, my life I trained my life or I'd been trained by Yahweh not to mix with those sort of things or do those sort of things and uh, some of you out there would probably also if you look back at your life it was reasonably lonely because you didn't do what the things in the what the world does. You know, I wasn't partying, I wasn't drinking. Uh, drugs in our day, you never even knew what a drug was, so uh, it's only probably today. But you can see today how they they easily get mixed up with the world and then they go downhill. Uh, we all know a certain person who uh, came out of the world. And unfortunately, has gone back into the world. So bad companionships ruin good habits. You'll be like the people who you associate with. Proverbs 30, 20. He who walks with the wise shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be broken. So the scripture is quite clear, quite plain. We're not to mix with fools. We're not to mix with those who we know are not doing the right thing. You know, you can't go and mix with people who are on drugs and who are drinking without you eventually um, compromising and becoming like them. 1 Corinthians 15.33 Do not be led astray. Bad companionships ruin good habits. So if you want to lose getting into the kingdom of heaven, just mix with the wrong people. All right, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. So, you know, sometimes, yes, you, 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 when you go to work, yes, you, you have to mix with these other people, but you don't have to do what they do. Um, you go shopping, yes, you, there's other people, we're, we're there, but we don't have to do what they do. Sometimes, some people, they get so embarrassed, that they're not uh, strong in their own uh, decisions that they want to do, is they start mixing with these people and before long they're dragged into the same things that they're doing. Exodus 34, 16. You take from their daughters for your sons and their daughters fornicate with their Elohims and they lead your sons to fornicate with their Elohims. Again, the scripture is very clear on who we partner, who we take as a partner. If you take a partner like here in the Old Testament where the if you're a man, you're going to marry a woman, naturally, and uh, she's worshipping other Elohims, well, eventually you're going to get sucked into the same thing. And we'll see later on here quotations about Solomon. Basically, it's very doubting. I doubt very much whether Solomon made it into the kingdom of Yahweh. So you've got to be very careful. 
Unfortunately, it's a shame we didn't know this before. Well, for me anyway. The first wife I married, um, fortunately, was not, didn't love Allah him, Yahweh, like I love him. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not unite in marriage with unbelievers. For what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? And what fellowship does light have with darkness? And what agreement does the Messiah have with Satan? Or what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? And what harmony has the sanctuary of Elohim with idols? For you are the sanctuary of the living Elohim, even as it is said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Because of this, come out from among them, and be separated, says Yahweh. And do not touch the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says Yahweh Almighty. You know, I thank Yahweh that uh, eventually he, he introduced me to Charmaine, and she loves Yahweh even more than I do. And uh, it's been the best thing that ever happened to me, to be married to a woman even though in her early years she was probably as far off as you could get. But Yahweh knew her heart. She came to him, she accepted him, loved him, and then he allowed me to marry her. And uh, I could not think of a better woman to have married. Deuteronomy 7, 2-5 And when Yahweh your Elohim shall give them up before you, and you strike them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall not cut a covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Nor shall your, you intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughter to his son, nor you shall take his daughter to your son. For he will turn your son away from following me, that they may serve other Elohim. And the anger of Yahweh will glow against you, and he will destroy you quickly. But you shall deal with them in this way. You shall break down their altars and shatter in pieces their pillars, and you shall cut down their asherahs, and you, you will burn their carved images with fire. You know, we don't, we forget, we think, oh, well, that was just in the old days, in the Old Testament. That Yahweh, actually, when the Israelites come into the land, he, he made them destroy, kill every one of those who, who worshipped other idols, worshipped other gods. You know, we, we forget how serious Yahweh considered it. 1 Kings 11, 1 to 6. Now here's King Solomon. Now Solomon was one of the wisest men out. Yahweh had blessed him with such wisdom, finances, money, everything else. In the beginning, he started off really well. But Solomon had a weakness like most men. And King Solomon loved many foreign women, even the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, Hittites, of the nations which Yahweh said to the sons of Israel, you shall not go into them, and they shall not go into you. They shall turn aside your heart after their Elohim. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives. Can you imagine? Seven, you just, no, you can't imagine it. You can't imagine having 700 wives. Princesses and 300 concubines. That's, that's a thousand women. And his wives turned away his heart. Now, they reckon Solomon had great wisdom. <laughs> I think he lost it there. Seven, a thousand, imagine a thousand women he, he was basically serving. And his wives turned away his heart. And it happened at the time Solomon was old. His wives turned away his heart after other Elohims. And his heart was not perfect with Yahweh, his Elohim, like the heart of his father David. It's interesting, when he was old, I don't know whether he ever uh, turned back to Yahweh, but with a thousand wives turning his heart away, it doesn't look too good. And Solomon went after Ashtaroth, goddess of the Sidonians. And after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites, Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of Yahweh, 
and did not go fully after Yahweh like his father David. So it doesn't look too good for Solomon. He did evil in the sight of Yahweh. If you do evil in the sight of Yahweh, you don't get in. And he was not like his father. His father David, even though he committed adultery, he repented. And he loved Yahweh. Malachi 2, 11, 12. Judah has cheated on Yahweh, a sickening violation of trust in Israel and Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the holiness of Yahweh by falling in love and not running off with foreign women, women who worship alien gods. Yahweh's curse on those who do this. No, so for those that uh, get mixed up with the wrong crowd, do the wrong thing, then I mean, basically a curse comes on those who do that. Drive them out of house and home. They're no longer fit to be part of the community. No matter how many offerings they bring to Yahweh of the angel armies. So basically we can see there, you know, we start mixing with the world. Start mixing with those who are disobeying Yahweh, maybe drinking, getting drunk, going into drugs, stealing, whatever. Even though you call yourself a Christian, a curse will come upon you. And a curse usually brings a few demons with it. Galatians 1.4 Who gave himself for our sins so that he might deliver us out of the present evil age according to the will of our Elohim and Father. You know, why is there so much evil in the world today? Why is there so many drugs, alcohol, fatherless children? It's because it's an evil age. The devil basically is still running it. 2 Corinthians 4.4 to those whose eyes have been blinded by the God of this world because they did not believe lest the light of the glorious good news of the Messiah who is the image of Yahweh should shine on them. You know, most people out there, their eyes have been blinded by the God of this world because they didn't believe, didn't want to believe. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to sin, do what everybody else is doing. Enjoy this world. Enjoy this evil age. John 14, 30. I shall no longer speak many things with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. So Satan basically is the ruler of this world. It's an evil world. There's so much evil out there. For us to survive, it takes a strong-willed person. We can't be just namsy pamsy oh well, they're doing it, I'll just go with them, I'll just party with them, I, I know they're going to be drinking and getting drunk, so I'll just turn up and go to that party, I'll just be there. Nothing will happen to me. Oh yeah? Solomon. Look what happened to Solomon. Luke 14, 25, 35. And great crowds came together to him, and turning he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not love less than me, his father and mother, his wife and children and brothers and sisters and beside even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You know, we cannot put anybody or anything above Yahweh. I cannot love Charmaine more than him, my wife. She cannot love me more than Yahweh. I'm sure she wouldn't. Cannot put anything above anything else but Yahweh. Some people love golf more than Yahweh. Some people love whatever you can think of. What's your favourite thing? Is it your grandchild? Is it your child? Is it your son, your daughter, whatever? No, you can't love them more than Yahweh. He comes first. Whatever he wants you to do, that you've got to do. And whoever does not bear his torture stake and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For who of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has the things to finish? That having laid a foundation and not having strength to finish, all these, those seeing begin to mock him. Saying, this man began to build and did not have strength to finish. But what king going to attack another king in war does not first sit down and take counsel 
whether he is able with 10,000 to meet those coming upon him with 20,000. But if not, he being still far off, sending a delegation, he asks the things for peace. So then every one of you who does not forsake all his possessions is not able to be my disciple. I'll read that again. So then every one of you who does not forsake all his possessions is not able to be my disciple. We're in this world here to be tested. Are we ready to forsake that, those things that we love the most for him? We're not able to be his disciple. We're not, not able to be his follower. You know, it's like us when we learn about Christmas and Easter. If you can't give up Easter and Christmas for him, you'll never be his disciple. If you can't give up Sunday for the Sabbath, you won't be his disciple. If you can't give up the person you love for him, you cannot be his disciple. If you cannot give up your hobby for him, you cannot be his disciple. If you cannot give up your job for him, you cannot be his disciple. If you cannot give up your house, you cannot be his disciple. And sometimes he's going to test us. He's going to ask you, I want you to do this. And you say, well, I can't. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm too busy. Well, you can't be his disciple. Salt is good, but if it, the salt becomes bland, with what will it be seasoned? It is not fit for soil nor for manure. They throw it out. The one having ears to hear, let him hear. We have to be ready. We have to be listening. What does he want me to give up to prove that I love him more than anything else? And he will. He'll test us. He might even be at your door at the moment. You're, you're struggling, you're worrying. You're, what, what does he really want? What do I have to do? And you've got to make a decision. All right, Father, I'll give that up. Sometimes it's just little things like uh, magnums. <laughs> I love magnums. And sometimes he's just asking me, hey, Alex, I want you to give up the magnums. And I've got to say, well, all right, yes, Father. And then later on, after I give them up, he tells me why. He says, because they're destroying your health. He always has a reason for it, and it's a good reason. But when he's asking you to do it, you struggle with it. You're thinking, oh, you know, I'm just hearing things. That's the devil. No, it's him. I look back at my life and the things he's asked me to give up. In my first marriage, he told me, he said, I'm taking her within 12 months. I thought he was going to take her. To, he was, she was going to die, but that's my first wife. But it wasn't. It was the day she asked me for a divorce. And I said yes. But he'd already prepared the next woman, which was Charmaine. And I got a better deal. See, so, sometimes he asks you hard things. He asked me to give up work. I said, yes, Father, when? And in the end, I got a better deal. I travelled the, the whole world, basically, and he paid the way, and I'm now living better than ever I lived before. When he asks us to do something, we've got to do it. And he, you know, really, behind it all is a good reason. He just doesn't do it for fun. So then every one of you who does not forsake all his possessions is not able to be my disciple. Which basically means if we cannot obey him in what he's asking us to do, 
then you'll never be his disciple. And if you're not a disciple, you won't probably enter into the kingdom of heaven with him. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. Sometimes what do we love the most to sit in front of our TV in a nice lounge chair, turn off our heads and our minds and just switch channels. And sometimes some of the things we watch we shouldn't be watching. There's so much rubbish on the TV lately. I'd hate to think what the next generation is going to be like. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, people love their drugs, they love their alcohol, they love their wine. You know, we're looking today out the window and we're seeing the buses go by as everybody's going to the winery, probably drunk by the end of the day, because they love their wine. We love our relaxation of going down to the beach or travelling or whatever we're doing and not getting to church on the, on the Sabbath and giving the Sabbath to him. I'm always amazed sometimes that on the Sabbath day it's the sun shining, the wind's not blowing, although it is today, and I could be very tempted to go out and fly my aeroplanes. I said, no, I give it to you, Father. I'm not loving my flying of my aeroplanes more than I love him. Because all that which is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and its lust, but the one doing the will of Elohim abides forever. It's worth me while reading that again. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. Now think to yourself, what are the things of the world that we love? All right, we don't drink. We don't take drugs. What do we love? Well, sometimes we love going to the pictures. Sometimes we're watching the wrong pictures, the wrong things. Sometimes we love just resting at home, watching TV, wrong thing. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. We like to be number one. We like to people to say, oh, you're so wonderful, you're so good, you're, man, what you, you know, you've done such a great job. As a pastor and a preacher, I've got to watch out that people, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this because I want people to say, oh, what a great preacher you are, how anointed you are, how great you are. I just want to serve him. I just want to bring the word, this is a, probably sometimes a very hard word, probably like this word. You know, I could bring a nice message every time I stand up here. But it's the wrong thing. I'm not here for you to praise me or to worship me or to think how great I am. I'm here to bring the word of Yahweh. And sometimes, most of the time, it's going to be a hard word because it's going to bring changes. You've got to make decisions. You've got to change your life because I want to see you get into the kingdom of heaven. And there's many preachers out there that are just bringing a nice message. Oh, you're saved. Come to the altar and I'll pray for you and you're saved. You're going to go to heaven. No, they're not. Very few are going to get in. And the world is passing away in its lust, but the one doing the will of Elohim abides forever. And as we know, over the last probably seven years, ten years, we've found out what is to do the will of Elohim and has been hard. We've had to change our diets. Our chef, poor old Charmaine, she used to love eating um, lobster and uh, all the food, fish that Yahweh said you can't eat. And she said, that's it, I'm changing. Even though I loved it, that's it. What do you struggle with? What do you love that he said he, you can't eat? Most people out there, it was bacon. <laughs> The old pig, especially the Filipinos. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13. Beloved, do not be astonished 
at the fiery trial happening among you for your testing. Get that in your brains and in your heads, so wherever it is, maybe write it on a piece of paper and put it on your fridge. None of us are accepted from it. At the, but don't be astonished at the fiery trial happening among you for your testing. Now, Trevor's going through a very fiery trial at the moment. He doesn't know whether he's got a job or he hasn't got a job. It's a fiery trial. How are you going to approach it? How are you going to look at it? How are you going to stand there? Are you going to worry yourself to death for the rest of the week waiting to, to, for the interview? How much do you trust Yahweh? It's a fiery trial. He's testing. He, every time he's testing us. When Charmaine goes off for four, four weeks overseas, it's a bit of a trial. It's a trial for her. It's a trial for me who's at home, think, look, wondering, you know, how's she going on the planes? What's happening to her when she's in Israel? You know, there's people over there being stabbed to death by the Palestinians. Uh, planes can fall out of the sky. Uh, she can lose her luggage. She can get lost. It's a trial for both of us. But we trust Yahweh. We just say, well, if he sent her, that's it. She'll come home safe and sound. It's costing us thousands of dollars to do it. How's our finances going? You know, all our finances going on a, on a trip. It's a trial, it's a test. Every time we've gone overseas, it's been a test. But we've learnt, we've gone through the trials, we've succeeded, we know. Every time when she comes home, our finances will be exactly the same as when she left. He's looking after us. How are you going through your trial? What is your trial you're going through at this moment? Is it your family? Is it your friends? Are you losing friends? Are you losing family members? Are you losing your job? Have you got a job? Have you got money? If you haven't got money? It's always a trial. As if a surprise were occurring to you. But rejoice! We only succeed through the trials. Remember this. And for, even for Trevor, he's got to rejoice that he's going through a trial. Because out of the end, you're going to see a miracle. Rejoice in every trial you go. I'm rejoicing that Charmaine's overseas. She's going to have a great time. There's going to be healings and the Holy Spirit's going to be moving and all sorts of things are going to happen. And she's going to come home. And already her foot's... The pain's gone out of her foot. She had a broke her toe before, just before she left. What a trial. What would you do? You'd cancel the trip and say, well, I'm not going on that trip because I've got a broken toe. I'm going to be in pain travelling on that plane. I'm in pain carrying my suitcases. But no, we're going to be rejoicing when she comes home of all the wonderful things she's done and the blessings that people have had and our finances are exactly the same as when she left. The key to your trial is to rejoice because out of it you're going to see a miracle. Now in a way Bill's going through a trial in trying to build this big shed of his and fix it all up and everything, you know. And he's wondering, you know, how's he going to do the next bit and where's the finances going? Are they going down because, you know, spending all this money and etc, etc. And then it'll be a trial. So you just rejoice. Yahweh, you're looking after me. You're watching over me. Yes, you're testing me. And we as Christians who love him have got to realise if he's not testing you, he doesn't love you. If you're not being tested, then there's something wrong. If I'm not being tested, there's something wrong. I've been tested for the last seven years with cancer. And yet I have seen miracle after miracle happen and I am still alive after seven years. I'm still healthy. I'm, st I'm not in pain. I don't even think I've got cancer. And I've seen miracles happen. 
If I didn't have it, I would never see these miracles. Because my ministry is based all around a lot of times of healing ministry. I love praying for sick people. I love seeing the miracles. And now he's testing me in the same thing. If you're not being tested, you're in trouble. Because the devil's looking after you. But when you're tested, rejoice. Key. Remember. I remember. Alex, remember. When I'm starting to feel tested, rejoice. That you participate in the suffering of the Messiah, that so you may also rejoice and exult at the revelation of his glory. James 4, 1-10. From where cometh conflicts and fightings from among you? Is it not from your lusts warring in your members? You covet and yet you do not have. You, mur you murder and are jealous and are not able to possess. You fight and you strive and you have nothing because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you do not ask sincerely. You ask in order that you may satisfy your lusts. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship of the world is enmity with Elohim? Do you not know that friendship of the world is enmity with Elohim? That's something to remember. We cannot be friends of the world, this evil world. Whoever then purposes to be a friend of the world is an enemy of Elohim. Or do you think that vainly the scripture says that pride dwelling in us lusts with envy. But he gives greater grace because of this it says Yahweh sets himself against proud ones but he gives grace to humble ones. Then submit to Yahweh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do you get the devil to flee? Rejoice. Rejoice in your troubles. Rejoice what's happening. It's just given me a great thought. I'm constantly praying for my two daughters. Yahweh is definitely on one of them. I mean, the devil is definitely on one of them. So I'm going to start rejoicing. Drive that devil away from her. Draw near to Elohim and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded ones. Be distressed and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy into shame. Be humble before Yahweh and he will exalt you. John 15:19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Are you of the world? If you're not of the world, then you know that Yahweh has chosen you. Interesting. He has chosen us to be not of the world. That's why we're here. That's why you're here in this place at this moment. Obeying him. Because he's chosen you and me. He's chosen us out of the world. We're not of the world. You know, most of us here, you know, you can say, you, you're, not, you're not of the world. I know I'm not of the world. I'm definitely not of the world. I can't stand drinking. I can't stand drugs. I can't stand uh, murder. I can't stand stealing. I can't stand lying. I can't, I, I hate parties actually. I'm not of this world. I was never a party goer. I was never one who wanted to go where all the other guys were going. Sometimes I think, why well, I hated, I didn't like going to sports. I didn't like football. You know, you watch, look at football today, it's a, it's a counter religion. 
For some reason, Yahweh has called me out of the world. I don't like the things of the world. I don't like watching some of the stuff on TV. When I turn to those channels, I, I, I can't stand it. Sometimes I wonder where the cooking shows are of the, of the world. I can't stand the cooking shows. <laughs> you know? We've got to think, you know, do you love the things of the world that the world's doing? Well, then maybe you're not of the world. I mean, you are of the world. When you start to hate the things of the world, what the worldly things do, you know, I couldn't stand travelling on a, on a bus going around looking at all the wineries and having a little sip of wine, a little sip of wine here and there. I, I'd hate it. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. And there ends the lesson for today. So I hope Yahweh is speaking to us all. You know, there's probably even more things of this world that I personally have got to hate because I'm not of this world. He's chosen me out of the world. I hope he's chosen all of you out of this world. That you don't want the things of the world or do the things of the world. You want to do what he wants us to do. So when you have some spare time, ask Yahweh, what does he want you to do? What's the fiery trial that you're going through at this point in time? How are you supposed to handle that fiery trial? Well, the simplest thing we've learned probably today is rejoice. Rejoice because you're going to see a miracle. Amen. Amen. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Yair Adonai pana v'lecha v'yichuneka. Yisa Adonai pana v'lecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.